what has the general atmosphere been like in your city and your community since the murder of Mr. George Floyd? Well, I think uh, here in New York City, where I live, uh, where I'm raising my my two children, um, it's been it's been difficult. Uh, I mean, obviously here, as in all around the country and all around the world, um, people have been watching what's been happening in Minneapolis. I mean, the, the initial uh, murder of Mr. Floyd um, by the Minneapolis police, and, and the video that circulated, uh, and then uh, the protests that started there and have spread uh, really around the country. And of course, New York City is no stranger to police violence and police brutality or protests against those things. And so um, the protests here started and started really in force um, over the weekend and have continued since then. Um, but I think it's combined with the fact that we are in the midst of a pandemic and people have been uh, in the house for the better part of three months. Uh, people have not had a chance to gather in community um, to grieve loved ones, to uh, support one another, to celebrate even. Um, and so that, that feeling of, uh, of this kind of outpouring of people in the streets, I think, is connected both to uh, people's particular feelings around this uh, egregious uh, police murder, um, but also uh, so many of the other kind of social and political tensions that have been um, uh, kind of festering over the last several months and the last several years. Because of this, you attended a protest in New York City this past week. Could you describe the atmosphere there? Sure. I mean, as, as you are probably aware, there are protests, uh, again, all over the country and, and now uh, in many parts of the world. Um, in New York, there have been multiple protest sites. Um, it's, you know, oftentimes in, in the past, there have uh, protests around some of these issues have been kind of singularly focused in one particular borough or one, one part of Manhattan, say, um, around City Hall or Times Square. Um, and, and this time around, I think that's one of the things that's really notable is how diffuse or how spread out um, this protest activity has been. And so I, um, I live in Harlem, and so I, I attended uh, the, the, the kind of convening or, or protest that was, was uh, which took place on Saturday uh, at the state office building on 125th Street, which is the main commercial um, kind of boulevard uh, avenue in Harlem, 125th Street, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. And uh, the time I got there, I was supposed to start at one. I didn't get there till uh, closer to 1.45. Um, by that point already, um, the protests had sort of splintered into multiple protests. And there were at least two different marches that I know of moving in, in different directions, you know, away from that kind of center center meeting place in central Harlem, although there were still people uh, that remained there at the, at the central meeting place and there were speeches and, um, and a press conference of sorts, I understand. Um, so I caught up uh, with a march that was heading west on 125th Street, um, away from central Harlem and towards the Hudson River on the west side of, uh, of Harlem in Manhattan. Um, the group that I joined up in, and it was you know, fairly spontaneous uh, as far as I could tell, was made up with a lot of young people, a lot of high school and college age uh, people. Um, I would say it was probably majority black, but it was definitely multiracial and multi-ethnic. Um, and the spirit was defiant. People, people were, had a kind of righteous anger, but there was a, uh, a kind of, I don't want to call it a celebratory mood, but there was, there was a, I think, a feeling of some, some, it was certainly energized. People were energized by, by being out, again, having been in the house and not having been together in any kind of community for, for quite a long time. And um, but that sense of defiance also led people, uh, led the march, you know, onto the West Side Highway on the west side of Manhattan, where it shut down traffic going in both uh, north and south directions. Um, and there was a, a as the as the march grew. I mean, there was a real a real sense of spirit and a real sense of um, that these were issues that could not be ignored, and you know, business as usual could not continue in this country until there's a real reckoning with um, not only the specific murder of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, of Tony McDade in Florida, uh, and and we can go on and on on that list. Not only those those specific incidents, um, but the larger issue of um, the kind of over policing of certain communities, um, the diversion of really needed and necessary um, 
budget budgets funds monies um, into these militarized police departments and away from things like public health away from things like housing away from things like uh, mental health and so um, I think all of that was was kind of wrapped up in this in this march but it was a it was a it was actually a beautiful beautiful sight um, as you probably know black Americans have been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus um, do you think this fact and the reasons behind it are obviously playing into these protests? And were you yourselves um, personally worried about getting sick when you made the decision to go protest in New York? Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't concerned beyond my normal concern of when I leave the house. I mean, I've been, in, I've been you know, under, under the kind of stay at home order in New York since uh, early to mid March. Um, I'm here with my, with my family, um, we take our kids out just to the park, you know, we try to get out every day if we can. Um, and so we take precautions. We always wear masks and, you know, keep our, keep distance, social distance from, from other people and so forth. And so, you know, insofar as I've been, you know, become accustomed to that way of, way of living, um, I wasn't particularly concerned, wasn't more concerned about going out to the protest outside um, with a mask. And I was, I was happy or, 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 or relieved to see that you know, virtually everyone else that I saw at the protest was, were, were wearing masks. Um, I was you know, concerned for my safety as I, as I always am in any type, any type of protest or demonstration, um, particularly when police are involved or it's confronting uh, the issue of police power. I was concerned for my, the safety, the potential um, for confrontations, uh, physical confrontations with police. Although on that particular day, um, police kept their, kept their distance and so that wasn't really a concern. Um, but to the first part of your question, I absolutely think that um, the kind of disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black and brown communities and working class communities um, and the really inadequate responses of particularly the federal government, government but even um, to some extent um, our, our, our state and local leaders uh, have played uh, a really central role in sort of the feeling that people are bringing to the streets and to these protests. Um, and again, as I say, um, one, of the, one of the mantras and one of the kind of central um, tenets of this protest movement, which I think is slightly different from earlier iterations of what we would call Black Lives Matter, is, is, is the kind of centrality of the, of the call to defund the police, right? Is, 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 to, is, to, to, is to shrink police budgets, right? To shrink the police force altogether, um, but not solely for the sake of uh, an anti-police vision, but for a vision of the world that, 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 that has robust public health, right? That has robust housing for everyone. I and mean, we have an incredible homeless uh, problem in New York City, right? And, and homeless people, of course, unhoused people are also disproportionately at risk and vulnerable to, to COVID-19. How can you shelter at home when you have no home? So um, the sense of, of, uh, of pushing back against the police is also about you know, pushing a, a vision for uh, our society that, that takes care of all of us and takes care of all of us equally and so sees all of us as equally valuable. Um, and further on the topic of protests, um, there has been a divide in opinion concerning whether or not the violence that sometimes comes with these protests is necessary. And what do you have to say to this matter? Well, I think we have to be a little bit specific about the violence that we're talking about. I mean, as I see it, as I not as I personally observed in, in, in the protests I attended, but as as as, a, as we've seen around the country, um, in Washington D.C. and in Minneapolis and in Atlanta and in L.A., Kansas City and 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 all around, uh, so much of the violence has been uh, has been perpetrated by police. Police have been the instigators. Um, they have. Um, uh, overreacted. Uh, they've been overly aggressive. Uh, they have often provoked um, uh, confrontations with protesters. Um, they are using weapons of war, um, you know, tear gas, pepper spray, um, Black Hawk helicopters flying over, flying low over DC and other cities. Um, so, you know, I think any conversation around violence and protest in this in this context has to has to start from that premise that that um, that by and large. Uh, protesters have been, you know, non-confrontational and, uh, and, and non-violent. Um, but as far as um, the the kind of violence against property uh, that we've that we that we've seen, uh, what some people might call looting, um, you know, I think one that's that's been largely overblown by the media by, by some of the media coverage, which has really tried to focus on that. Um, but also, 
I, and I think an impact of that has been for, for many um, Americans and, and maybe people elsewhere to, to, lose, to lose focus, right? To lose kind of a, a sight of like what was actually more important, right? The, a, a store um, and the contents of a store, which are insured. Um, and many of the stores that are broken into are um, or vandalized or what have you are, are part of multinational corporations, right? That can absorb those losses. Um, as opposed to the to, to, to lies, right? Because this is in the end of the day, these protests are a fight for lies, right? It's a fight for uh, the, the the value of, of human life, and so um, I think by and large, uh, the, the 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 violence question or the violence sort of debate has has been really skewed in, in ways that are not really helpful to understanding the, the the scope of the protest. And you mentioned a little bit about this already, but. In general, what do you think of how the media is covering the events that have been unfolding this past week? I think, you know, we see a few different things uh, at work. I mean, one, we see how ill-prepared most uh, corporate media or mainstream media is to really kind of grasp what's happening, right? You have so few reporters who are uh, who are versed in uh, in urban affairs? So few reporters, more more importantly, who are who are, who are versed in class issues, you know, who, who who understand what working people go through, who come from working class backgrounds, and so few reporters who are conversant in 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 ideas and and, and um, analyses of race, and that sort of has played out in, in, in so much of the commentary and so much of the reporting. Um, you know, I think we also see a, a kind of media structure that um, sets up everything in terms of dichotomies, everything in terms of binaries, and sees everything in, in terms of a, a very simple sort of contest between either good and bad, right and wrong, um, and, and can't really appreciate and is not really interested in exploring nuance. Um, we see this so much in our political coverage, right? And, and everything is sort of tallied in terms of a, uh, almost like it's a sporting event or an athletic contest. Um, you know, who, who scored points, who kind of, you know, won the day in that debate rather than like the substance or the rightness of anyone's particular set of ideas. And I think the way a lot of this has been covered has, has, has reflected that. And then finally, um, our, our media, and now, now I'm sort of extending beyond journalism to, to include our entertainment media, is so deeply immersed in a kind of pro-police or a uh, kind of perspective or, or you know, it's to, to the extent that most of us don't even realize. I mean, that if we think about the number of, 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 of television shows and movies um, that are written from the perspective of police, right, or that sympathize, sympathize with police and investigations and prosecutions, I mean, it's, it's, it's hundreds upon hundreds that we all absorb, and some of them are quote-unquote good shows. I mean, they're done well, and some of them are not good shows, but but irrespective of kind of quality is the perspective and the way that I think that has, has, has sort of um, seeped into so much of our thinking that it's hard for them people when they when they see these contests um, the, the, these confrontations or these uh, protests to uh, remain quote-unquote sympathetic to protesters right because they, they see the police as inherently good as, as inherently um, out to protect all of us to keep people safe in all these ways um, and it's very difficult for many people to think about police as um, protecting uh, the status quo of, of, the, of uh, our economic system, to be protecting um, private property above human life, to value some lives over others, right? That, that there might be some kind of some, something um, amiss systemically uh, with the police rather than individual actions of individual police officers. And I think a lot of that kind of ties back to um, um, the, our kind of media culture and the way that we valorize police. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point because now that I think about it, like a lot of the shows that I consumed were like police based and how they're all good people. Well, I mean, we all watch we all watch those, those yeah, kind of shows, yeah. and you know, I mean, as I said, there are, there are good shows and, and less good shows, and um, you know, even those ones that might show some level of police corruption often portray that as you know, the, the work of a few bad actors, right? Yeah, and very, inherently. Very you know, if you remove those bad actors, you prosecute those people, you remove them from the police force, the police can go on about their business, which is inherently a good, you know, thing. And it, and it doesn't leave any room for us to kind of question, you know, at a kind of base level, what is the function of police? Why do we have police? And why do we have so many police? I mean, New York City has uh, a police force, I think, of about 45,000 officers, which is the size of, you know, a small city, Right, the, the 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 budget for the new, for NYPD is is approaching six billion dollars. The annual budget is six billion dollars. 
so we need the space to even question at a fundamental level, do we need that? Is that, is that providing a social good? And if we don't need that, you know, where can we, how can we redirect some of that, uh, some of those resources? Um, yeah, that's crazy. I, like, I did not know that it was $6 billion a year. Um, I feel like they could use that more wisely. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on from uh, the media, what are your thoughts on people using Dr. Martin Luther King quotes to argue against the riots happening right now? Well, I mean, I think it speaks to a larger problem of people's um, distorted and incomplete views of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. himself and the civil rights movement more broadly and American history more broadly. Um, and that's, you know, part of why I do what I do. I teach, you know, American and African American history is, is, to, is to help uh, complicate um, some of those narratives. Um, but, you know, in terms of King, I mean, people are, are, are egregiously selective on how they think about King, right? They reduce him um, to a, a two-dimensional figure who, you know, stood up and gave this you know, amazing speech um, in August of 1963. Um, but even the I Have a Dream speech, which, you know, most the majority of Americans would recognize um, some, some part of it, right? Even that, it, it, the part that's quoted is so truncated, right? Such a limited, you know, it's it might be two or three dozen words, right? The content of his character, all children, you know, grow up to be that kind of thing, right? But not actually even the economic vision um, that, that he critique that he was laying out in that speech, let alone the kind of the breadth of his career and particularly the last three years or so um, when he was explicitly um, uh, uh, having a, offering a kind of uh, internationalist vision that was, that was critiquing U.S. military and U.S. military power and an economic vision that was about challenging capitalist system. And it's all there in his writings. It's all there. We can, there are many speeches one could point to um, and writings in 1966, 7, and 8 um, that offer a much more radical vision of a, a much more radical king um, that we could also point to. And I think in that period of the, those last several years of his life, um, King, you know, spoke uh, on, on multiple occasions, particularly in the wake of the, the Watts riots in 1965 um, and, and other uh, urban rebellions after that, um, you know, he offered a, a, a perspective that was incredibly sympathetic to rioters, right? Not, you know, not violence for violence sake. I mean, that was never his um, that was never his position, but uh, certainly wasn't a kind of blanket condemnation of anyone um, for, for um, who felt powerless, who felt voiceless, who felt disenfranchised and dispossessed um, to, to express themselves, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of language, which is the language of, of the United States, which is a language uh, historically, which is a language of violence. Um, uh, and so I think that kind of way that King is, is used is, is um, not helpful in, in many respects and, and I think um, does no no service to his actual um, life's work. You've also taught courses on the civil rights era. What would you say are the biggest similarities and differences between what is happening now and then? So that's great. It's something I've been thinking about a lot and I haven't, um, you know, all the way processed. We're in the middle of something right now. It's sort of hard to see, where, of course, where it will go and how, you know, what shape it will take. But if we sort of take this, this period more broadly and think of this sort of as that kind of era of Black Lives Matter um, over the last, let's say, six to eight years, um, this kind of, this, this moment or this, this extended kind of moment of, of, of uh, protest activity and compare it to the 1960s. I mean, you see similarities, of course, in terms of the uh, actually, I think in terms of the diversity of people who are involved, right? I think another way that that um, um, narratives of the civil rights era get um, get distorted are, um, are the way that ways that they portray the civil rights movement as being very singular, very monolithic, right? It's just a certain kind of the, the profile of protesters, a kind of uh, a, 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 a very passive uh, middle class, college age or high school age, you know, black student with some sympathetic whites involved. Um, there's no militancy. The militancy is completely stripped out, uh, but the militancy was there from the beginning. It, it, we can go back to the 30s and 40s, and it, it manifests again in the, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, even before we get 
get to black power, which some people often portray as the kind of end or the death of the, the kind of good civil rights movement. Um, but, but that strain of militancy was there all along. So there's, that's there, it was there then, it's there now. Um, but we see, obviously you see young people at the forefront of this protest movement and young people were the center, the center of the civil rights era. I mean, even, even Dr. King, right? I mean, people forget that when the Montgomery bus boy, boycott started, he was 26 years old, right? He died in his 30s, right? So even he wasn't even a, a kind of old figure in the way that he's sometimes portrayed to be or, or people imagine him to be. He was an adult, yes, and he had a family and was married, um, but he wasn't you know, particularly old. Um, and, and so you know, much of the kind of leadership and the organizers who are driving Black Lives Matter are, are folks who are in their, their teens, their 20s, and their, their early 30s, which is not unlike the civil rights era. And also a number of your colleagues at Princeton have been active on social media and visible in print, um, speaking out after the killing of George Floyd. Um, what have your conversations with colleagues been like in the past several days? Well, I think it's, it's difficult because we're, all, we're, we're separated, right? And I think the kinds of conversations we might have if we were able to gather together in a faculty, you know, faculty meeting, right, or, uh, or, or get together in person uh, might, might be a little bit different. And we're all, um, you know, many of us are parents. We're just trying to, you know, we're homeschooling our kids and we're trying to you know, take care of our, our, our professional and work responsibilities. And so it's been hard to really get together and really have um, uh, the, the kind of robust conversations that we, that we might have. But I think we've been really supportive of one another um, because, of, because of the difficulty sometimes that, that, that um, that arises in speaking out forcefully on some of these issues, uh, and so we so we know the kinds of uh, attacks that, that that people receive, have received, you know, attacks, you know, in terms of um, threatening emails and just harassing emails, abusive emails, phone calls, things like that, up to and including death threats. Um, uh, but I think a lot of us are also just really concerned about our students. It's difficult, again, to be away from campus, although, albeit, you know, the, the school year is now uh, you know, officially over, but, we, we, but we're thinking about our students still, you know, the ones who just graduated or who, who are just going out into this, this really um, fractured and difficult world, um, but even our continuing students who, who we, we will be back with in some form or another in the fall and thinking about how we can kind of best support them and help give them tools to, to understand what's happening. Moving on to Twitter. <laughs> um, President Trump recently tweeted about the protests. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. How did this language make you feel? And what have you made of President Trump's response to the protests? Well, this is a this is a man who's totally uh, unsuited for the office of the president. He's totally unsuited for the moment historically. I mean, his handling of the coronavirus uh, will go down in history as one of the kind of worst, um, kind of worst, wor uh, the kind of most mis you know terribly managed crises uh, certainly in American history, in some ways in world history, um, in this sort of modern world history. Um, and, you know, the, the way he uses social media and Twitter in particular, um, you know, in his entire time as uh, occupying the office of the president um, has been, uh, you know, unethical, improper, <laughs> uh, abusive, uh, damaging. Uh, we, can, we can go on. I mean, the, the, the kind of amount of damage that he has caused simply through his tweets. I mean, from, um, you know, kind of diplomatic errors, right? I mean, just forming um, American foreign policy through Twitter, right? Bringing us to the, to the, to the brink of various military confrontations, whether it's with Iran or North Korea, um, to abusing individual uh, citizens and individual Americans, uh, calling out whether it's uh, members of Congress or, or singling out particular journalists and so forth. And so this is all of a piece, I'm saying, this is all of a, of a piece of what he did. But with particular respect to the protests, um, obviously it's inciting, uh, inciting um, hatred, it's inciting the potential for violence, um, and it's done uh, in full, it fully, he's fully conscious of what he's doing, and it, despite his uh, attempts, you know, and the, the, the next day to sort of slightly couches, uh, couch his uh, sentiments and, and to walk things back just ever so slightly. Um, no, it was, a, it was a call to violence, right? It was a call to violence, either that was gonna be uh, meted out by, um, by the military or by police forces, or I think probably more, um, 
more likely by by his some of his supporters, his most violent uh, white supporters who are who are heavily armed, and this is the kind of contingent that we saw in Charlottesville um, three years ago. And so, um, you know, there's there's really no reason why Twitter should even allow him to continue to have a a, a Twitter account. Um, I mean, it violates their own um, their own user policies, um, and um, it puts you know not just a few lives, but it puts hundreds of thousands of lives in danger um, every day. Are there any policies in particular that you think would improve policing in America? And beyond that, how much of the issues of discriminatory policing, sorry, not policing, policing and racism can't be solved through politics? Well, I mean, yes, I think there there are particular policy um, decisions that can be made. I mean, one of the, the great things that has come out of the protest movement in Minnesota and Minneapolis um, already is uh, a number of entities, institutions uh, canceling or greatly scaling back their contracting with the police. So we saw the University of Minnesota first, incredible leadership by the president of the University of Minnesota who, who announced... Uh, just a, a couple of days after after the Floyd video started circulating, that um, that uh, she was directing her institution to cancel their their uh, contract, uh, their sort of campus police contract with uh, the university. Excuse me, with um, uh, the Minneapolis uh, police force. Um, and then I think just uh, in the last day or two, uh, the Minneapolis public schools uh, did you know pretty much the same thing, right? Which is which is huge about getting um, for for getting police out of public schools, which is an issue um, in, in many major cities, right? Rather than school safety officers or or, or school resource officers uh, or, or or staff members who are who are who work for the department, the respective departments of education, or or, or who are simply teachers or educators, right? We have police. We have police sometimes who are even armed, uh, oftentimes who are armed, or at least uh, part of these police forces. And um, that is a, that's a major issue around the country. That's a, that's a policy directive that, that mayors uh, and city councils all around the country could, could enact, you know, today, tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I, I talked earlier about this question of the budgets of police and police forces. I mean, you know, I think the budgets can be shrunk, um, you know, exponentially as as a step. That's a policy decision that, again, city councils and mayors can take. Um, the militarization of police, um, and this is something that that flows from the federal governments down. Um, but there's there's no reason why domestic police forces uh, should have the kind of weaponry um, and vehicles and equipment um, that American police forces have. There's just no there's no reason. And we see the way that these things get deployed on on peaceful protesters, on on people ex expressing their right to dissent, which is a which is supposed to be a, a kind of fundamental bedrock uh, tenant of this country. Um, you know, tear gas, helicopters, um, anti, you know, armored vehicles, all, all this weaponry. We saw this in Ferguson. We see it now. Um, it goes back to the, to the late 1960s, uh, that previous uh, era of rebellion. Um, we need, that's a policy decision. Those things can be, can be removed from the hands of uh, uh, local police forces. So I think there are a number of, of specific policy um, uh, decisions and policy um, directions that can be taken. Um, but but beyond that, um, there there we need to have this this conversation. And I think we're it's 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 being had at a level uh, well beyond anything that I've ever seen um, in my lifetime. Um, a, a conversation about what is the purpose of police? What is the purpose, the fundamental purpose of, of prisons, um, and, and that whole apparatus that connects the two? What is what is the purpose of these things in our society? And can we imagine a different way? Can we imagine a different world? And how do we get towards that world? That's, I think, the most exciting part of, of this protest movement is that people are uh, getting to articulate and speak widely about um, those kind of alternative visions. And it's, it's not just a subset of, of really radical, committed activists. It's not just a, a small group of academics. But this is, this is now spreading through the society. And people of different generations, of different backgrounds are, are, are willing to have these conversations. And I think it is uh, in no small measure because this particular um, crisis of policing and protests is, is, is abutting or happening in the midst of uh, the coronavirus um, crisis. And, and we see 
the kind of weaknesses of, of our public health system and our whole kind of social welfare system, so the social fabric, and the two things are couldn't be in, in kind of starker a starker um, distinction. And so I think uh, the, the protests are bringing these conversations together in a really exciting way. Yeah, um, I've definitely seen more conversations that uh, like students my age are having about how like we're questioning why we need the police and where their origins mm -hmm. are and stuff like that. That's um, great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, those are all the questions. If there is anything else that you wanted to say. No, I think, I think it was great. I appreciate your time and uh, the opportunity to talk to, to you and to the Prince. And uh, you know, I look forward to the time when we're kind of back on campus and we can kind yeah. of continue these conversations, you know, together uh, as a campus community. Um, okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, all right. Take care. Thanks, all right. You too. Take care.